Well, good afternoon. As you can tell, I'm in the car again. In fact, let me let me take my mask off um, since I'm, I'm by myself right now. Um, you know, we had a couple of appointments to do this afternoon uh, on the day before spring break. So I've been hoping to get outside all week to do uh, a very short intro video to, um, to the uh, John Porcelino readings we're going to do and to paper number four that we're going to be getting to after spring break. Um, so and I'm recording it on my can my uh, laptop because I have it here in the car because, um, you know, it's we're still in a point where you can't go into a, a place with, you know, I couldn't go with my wife to uh, her appointment. So I'm in the car and uh, it's a nice day out. It's a little chilly, but the sun is nice. So first off, I hope you all have a great spring break. Uh, you know, try to get some rest if you can. Uh, try to take a break from schoolwork and you know, I know you've all, uh, you know, got other jobs and, and family obligations, but, you know, try to try to enjoy yourselves, have a nice little break. The weather's supposed to be nice this weekend. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the, what we're going to do now that we have done the midterm and we're getting to the uh, second half of the semester. So first things first, um, the next thing we're reading, and I put this announcement up already, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just mention it again, is John Porcelino's uh, Perfect Example. Um, if you didn't already get a copy of the book, uh, please make sure you do so as soon as possible. I think the Harper Bookstore is probably sold out, but to be perfectly honest, I don't know if they ever even got any used copies in. There's plenty of used copies online. Uh, remember, for perfect example, there's two editions of it. They're exactly the same, so it doesn't matter which one you buy. Um, if you want to get the old edition uh, from 2005, um, you can get that one. Same same content. Uh, again, I think he added a couple of pages uh, of a biographical essay at the end, but I'll, I'll scan that so you all have it. But you can get this copy if you find one of these online, or if you get it in the mail and you're like, oh, wait a minute, it looks different. It's the same book. Again, they just reissued it uh, in February, actually. And so that's the new edition. There, again, it's the same book. Um, it's just, as you can see, they, they changed the size. They changed the cover a little bit. But this is the new edition. This is the old edition. It doesn't matter which one you buy. But make sure you get one of them. Um, we're going to do a quiz when we get back from spring break about the book. You can read it, read it all. Uh, make sure you've read it by March 31st. It's a graphic novel. It's not going to take you that long uh, to read it. But don't rush through it. That's one of the things I, I wanted to mention is, is do not do not rush through it because if you rush through it, um, what's going to happen is you're going to miss some of the details uh, and you're going to notice that particularly as you're reading through it um, is that you, you, you'll you kind of miss out on some of the more subtle subtle things that he does in the book. So make sure you're going to read it slowly. You know, look at how he uses the images. Um, as always, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask me and, and send me an email and I'll be happy to uh, you know, to give you other, other, other uh, you know, suggestions on it as you're reading and, and kind of taking a look at it. Um, what else can I mention about it? I want to talk a little bit about the, the paper that we're going to do first, and then I'll just give you some background on Porcelino. It seems very fitting, too, that I'm here in downtown Chicago. I'm on the corner here, parked at Clark and Chestnut, actually, downtown. Uh, and uh, part of the book does take place um, on Belmont Harbor, which I just passed by, actually, on our drive down here for, for the appointments that we had. Um, so for paper four, you're going to come up with a thesis for it. So you'll probably notice that on the directions for it, as you start thinking about it, and it's not due until, you know, again, the, the due dates are on there and this is after spring break and it's not the week after spring break. You can, you know, double check those, do, those deadlines when you get a chance. Um, you're going to brainstorm your own topic for this book. So as you're reading it, what I want you to do is to take notes on it. Take notes on the things that are interesting in it. After break, I'm gonna put up other videos where I help you brainstorm topics, but you're gonna come up with a topic and a focus. Now to do that, you've got to read the book first. So read Perfect Example first, right? Make sure you've read it. And then start looking through the sources on Blackboard. You're gonna notice there's all those different sources in the folder. There's interviews with Porcelino, uh, they're, uh, some of them are older, some of them are newer. The interviews are on different topics. Uh, so he, uh, in one of them, the Rob Clough interview, for example, he talks about working on this book and what he intended to do with it. There's a couple of other interviews where he talks about his background as a musician, his, uh, his background in Zen Buddhism. He was Catholic, raised Catholic as a kid, but, but became a Zen Buddhist as an adult, decided to, to, to take on and to become part of that religion. And that's part of you know the work that he does, that's important. Um, he's very clear, and you're gonna notice this also in Perfect Example, about his struggles with, uh, with anxiety and depression. So that's also part of one of the themes of the book. So 
as you're reading Perfect Example, what you want to ask yourself is what would you want to write about? What would you want to look into more in those sources in terms of research? Do you want to learn more about his Buddhism? Do you want to learn more about his artistic influences? Do you want to learn more about how he's he's learned to cope with um, the anxiety and the depression, which in his case, he has another book about uh, the OCD uh, diagnosis that he eventually got when he was an adult and, and how that affected him. Uh, and we are still back in a lot of the themes and ideas from the first half of the semester. He, he attempts to find, you know, different friend groups in the book. Um, he, 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 uh, he's reflecting on his experiences in high school. He's about to go to Northern for college. And so he's, he's talking a lot about that. He's reflecting on what he wants to do next, what he wants to major in, you know, so there's a lot of things that I hope resonate with you also when you read the book. As I mentioned at the very beginning of the class too, it's the only book I know of that is set in Palatine, Schaumburg, Arlington Heights, everywhere around campus, probably maybe those that's one of your hometowns. And so he has a lot of references to all those places because that's where he grew up. He was born in Chicago. And then his parents moved uh, out to uh, Hoffman Estates when he was about seven with him and his sister. So um, for the next paper, like I said, your, your job, and you're gonna have plenty of time to work on this when we get back from the break, is to get, you're going to be brainstorming and you're going to come up with a, a, an approach and an idea and your own thesis for this based on your reading of it and based on the research sources. And that's why you'll notice I, I've done a couple of articles on this book over the years. Um, and so I put a couple of those articles that I wrote up as well. One of them is more, more of a psychological analysis of the book. The more recent one that uh, I, I posted, which is actually being published next month, there's, it's coming out in a journal. Uh, next month or in April, I'm, I'm not sure, or April and May, I haven't gotten the, the dates from the editor yet. Uh, that's more on the musical influences that are in the book. So if you want to flip through those articles, you're welcome to. I think the more recent one that I wrote last year is is better, to be honest. If you, you know, it's, speaking of writing, I feel like it's more focused and I think it's better written than the one that I wrote 10 years ago. Uh, but it was interesting for me to go back and to write about this book again, just to kind of get my thoughts together. And uh, I'll talk about that too when we get back from break, how I came up with the ideas for those articles, how I brainstormed them, how I did the research, because I want you to have that experience too. Of, uh, you know, in this case, you have the sources and you've got the book, but you're going to come up with these ideas for your, your topics on your own. And again, I'm happy to help you. Okay. So that's paper four. One other thing I want to mention before I talk a little bit more about perfect example is please also make sure that you've gotten your copy of Solonin. We're going to do this book in connection with perfect example for paper number five. So these, this is the point in the class where we're gonna be using the book. So remember Solonin, you can also get online. I think the Harper Bookstore has sold out, but again, you can get a used copy of this too online. It shouldn't cost you that much to get both of the books. And we're gonna do Solonin as we get into April. After we get through paper four, Solonin will come in for paper number five. Okay, so just a quick reminder of that. So what can I tell you about John Porcelino? This is the point in the video, if you wanna start taking notes, you can start taking notes um, or play it back uh, if you want to. Uh, I'm First of all, I'm very excited that this book finally came back into print. I, I This is one of the first books I taught in my first class that I ever taught at Harper. I taught one class as a part-time faculty member at Harper in 2007, that summer. And when I was selecting books, I had just read Perfect Example maybe two years before that. I, found, I got a copy of it when I first got here to Chicago in 2005, right after it had been published. And I loved it. I really didn't know much about him as an artist. And I have to also admit that when I, I uh, taught the part-time class at Harper, I was actually teaching full-time at uh, Malcolm X College here in, in Chicago in the city. And uh, I, I did one part-time class at Harper before I came on as a full-time faculty member in uh, fall 2008. Not info that you need to know, but I just want to give some background on, on how the book ties into the uh, area around Harper. Um, when I started thinking about the books I was going to teach at Harper for that first summer 102 class, I think it was, might have been 101, uh, summer of 2007, uh, I realized that I said, you know what, the one book I know of that is set in Palatine and Schaumburg and Hoffman Estates is perfect example. I had just read it and I said, you know what, I'm going to teach it because it's connected, it's it's Hoffman High is one of the feeder schools for Harper. Uh, and so it was fun to teach it. And even back then I had students that said, oh, I went to Hoffman, um, you know, I, I'm gonna probably transfer to NIU. It was a summer class too. So some students may, actually may even have been NIU students who were back home for the summer and were taking the class with me. Uh, so it went out of print though. I used this book for years. I've always enjoyed it. Porcelino himself has come to campus a couple of times to give lectures, uh, which has been fun. 
Um, and so I taught it for a couple of different reasons. First of all, for a 102 class, it's very easy to research. There's a lot of information on him, a lot of interviews with him uh, because he's pretty uh, active in terms of talking about and promoting his work. Um, but I also like teaching it because again, it's local. You know, it, We've done a lot of Chicago writers up to this point and I would include him in that group with Cisneros and with Dybeck. He has the same concerns about memory, childhood, friendship, as a lot of those other Chicago writers that we've read, including Otto Binder. I mean, there's no science fiction in this, so we're, we're, there's none of those elements. He's not that kind of writer. Um, but he's still part of that kind of Chicago tradition of this autobiographical, very straightforward, down-to-earth kind of writing, very reflective writing with a touch of kind of mysticism to it as well. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it when you read it. Again, it, it, he wrote it when he was, uh, I think in his late 20s, but he started it when he was in college. So this was a, a story that he started thinking about and writing when he was an undergraduate at NIU. So let me dive into some of that background. He, he was born in Chicago. I think, I think he lived, he may actually mention this in the book. I, I, I'll have to flip back to the, the biography and check, but he, he grew up in the Jefferson Park neighborhood of Chicago. That's on the Northwest side. Um, you're almost outside the city when you're in Jefferson Park. He only lived there until he was about seven. Uh, you know, his grandparents still lived in the city, but his dad, who was a judge, and I believe his mom, who's reti retired now, his dad passed away years ago, but his mom, mom lives in DeKalb now, was a, was a nurse, I believe. Um, so when his father, you know, got another job as a judge uh, in, in the Hoffman Estates area, they moved into the suburbs when he was about seven. So most of his writing, actually, when he's writing autobiographically about his childhood and teenage years is all about, again, Hoffman Estates, Palatine, Schomburg, because that's where he grew up. Uh, if you remember the map assignment that we did for the first paper, that's that's the map of his neighborhood over at Hoffman uh, on Moon Lake Boulevard. And if you want to go back and look at that, it's in the folder. He, he went to NIU, as you're going to find out in the book, as a studio art major. He was a painting major in college. Didn't go to college for English to write stories. Didn't go to college to make comic books. He went as an art major. He was trained as, an, as a painter. Uh, if you read more about him in those interviews, he's heavily influenced by people like Andy Warhol, Cindy Crabb, who we read for the midterm is one of his big influences, uh, very influenced by uh, Picasso, you know, in terms of 20th century painter influences. In fact, some of his drawings even kind of have a Picasso look to them if you see the, some of the ones he's done more recently. Um, so he's got that training, but he also, as a kid, loved reading comics. He loved reading comic strips in the, in the newspapers, in the Tribune, in the Sun-Times, in the Chicago Reader. I think in one of the interviews, if you start skimming through them, he even mentions memories of his dad bringing home copies of the Chicago Reader, the free newspaper that's still around. And he would read all the newspaper strips in that, in that uh, local uh, newspaper. So he kind of had a double background. He liked comic books and cartoons, but he also loved painting. Love, as I said, Picasso and Andy Warhol and all these other painters. So in college, he started this. This is this autobiographical narrative, which is primarily, as you're going to notice, about his the end of his last year of high school at Hoffman High. And his, uh, well, he, we don't see when he actually gets to NIU, but he's applied for it. He gets into NIU uh, in the first chapter of the book. And then he starts making plans to go there for college. But the challenge that he runs into, and this is one of the major focuses of the book, is that anxiety and depression. It's not diagnosed. And you got to remember, this is 86 that this is, this is 1986. So a lot of the uh, treatments that we have now and the access to therapy and all those things that are really important uh, that, that we have access to now, not as common, not as common that many years ago, three, three, almost four decades ago now. And so he's, a lot of the middle of the book is his struggling with two things. Uh, well, three things, actually. He's a little nervous about going to college. Uh, and you can tell that he's sort of, you're going to see in his interactions with his mom and his dad, he, he, he's applying, he, he gets in, but he's still not sure because he's afraid about meeting new people there. Um, he still, his friends groups at Hoffman are also, he's sort of in between two different friend groups. So he's trying to figure out who he should hang out with. He's trying to figure out what kids he has the most in common with. So that theme of friendship comes up again and some of these friendships work out and some of them don't, you know, as the story progresses, you're gonna notice that as well. Uh, and, and so a lot of the episodes in the book are very plain spoken. They're very straightforward. That's what he does in his writing. He tries to give back these memories of, of, of things that he experienced as a young person. And he tries to share those stories with other people, not only to tell a story, but I think also much like Cindy Crabb, by the way, 
with the hopes that telling these stories will provide some comfort and reassurance to other people that might be struggling, right? It's struggling with mental health issues, with depression issues, with anxiety issues, uh, just struggling to live in the world. I mean, that's his, his work is um, much like Cisneros, much like Dieback, much like these other writers we've done. There's a lot of compassion to it. There's a lot of compassion for, uh, you know, the suffering of the world in, in, in Porcelino's books, the suffering of the world and how do we, how do we get through it together? How do we manage these issues together? How do we survive? There's moments in the book where he's, he's suicidal. So I want to warn you about that too. There's elements, uh, there's parts where he, he feels suicidal and luckily his friend Mark comes and, and pulls him out of that, that, that suicidal uh, frame of mind, thank goodness. And, and, you know, takes him on a little road trip to Milwaukee where they meet Mark's grandfather and that kind of revives him a little bit. It gives him a sense of confidence. It gives him a sense of community, which when you're in that state, if you're, at a, if you're feeling that way and you're feeling, uh, you know, it, it's a scared place to be, you know, to, to, to feel like you want to hurt yourself and you don't, you, you don't have a place in the world anymore. And that's what he grapples with in this book. And I want to mention that because again, I, that, that can be a, a very upsetting topic um, for, for readers. So just be warned that there is a scene in the middle where he does have those kind of suicidal thoughts but he, he is able to get through them again with that community, with his friend Mark, who's comes by and his parents and his family and his sister and, and his other friends. And so there's some darker parts to the book where he's kind of revealing the things he went through as a teenager. But then there's also that brighter side at the end. I don't want to give too much away about how the story progresses, but he he's able to work through it and he's able to get the support that he needs. Um, uh, and so and that's why, you know, as we always say, if, if, if you're ever having those kind of thoughts, uh, self-harm thoughts, you got to reach out for help. You got to You got to reach out and you got to ask for help. Don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to talk about your feelings. <laughs> so I know I'm sounding like one of your parents now, but um, again, it's another reason I like teaching this book because it grapples with those issues, those feelings that we all have at some point or another. Uh, and it show, and it gives a way of kind of working through them. And it, 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 I think one of the strengths of this book is its honesty, its honesty in trying to it, it, trying to reflect on what he experienced in that very difficult time between high school and college and what he was struggling with before, long before he got into his 20s and early 30s and was able to get help through a therapist and was able to get the right medication that, that mitigated th these uh, challenges that he had, right? And that's in his other books. He talks about that in, in uh, one called The Hospital Suite, The, the Struggle when he got into his late twenties, early thirties to, to deal with and to uh, uh, try to try to uh, find help for a lot of the depression issues. Uh, but it's, it's in here. He talks, he's very open about talking about these issues and uh, he's, he, you know what, now I'm remembering he even did a book that he didn't, he didn't write, but he drew a couple of years ago that was based on uh, a script that was, that was uh, about, um, again, suicide prevention. I'm gonna have to find it. I have a copy of that book at home in my office somewhere. It's a great book in terms of giving people that encouragement to ask for help and, and to try to get through these, these challenges. So with Perfect Example, what you're gonna notice is that he draws in a very simple style that's intentional. And that's one of the things he talks about in the interviews because he'll often get criticized. I've, I've heard him talk about this when he's come to Harper to give, to give lectures over the years. Um, he's had people say to him, well, can you really draw? Your drawings look childlike. And what he says is that he wants the drawings to be as simple as possible because he wants to convey his ideas and the characters and the plot. That's more important in these books than how elaborate and fancy his drawings are, okay? Uh, he's, again, he's trained as a painter. And, and if I can find images of some of his paintings, I'll share them with you. His paintings pretty, t tend to be kind of minimalist as well, but not as stripped down as this book looks. But again, the point of the book is to express these ideas, to express what he was feeling like and going through uh, as he was getting ready to go to Northern for college. And so that's the purpose of the book. The drawings are not supposed to look really elaborate uh, or complicated because he feels and this is something he talks about in, I think, the Rob Clough interview. He doesn't want the drawings to get in the way of the story. The story is more important for him, not the, not how fancy the drawings look. And so that's why the drawings are very simple and very, very straightforward. It's also why there's parts of the book, you'll notice, where there's no words at all. It's the images that tell the story. And that's where his painting kind of training, I think, kind of starts to come in. Um, but that honesty and that directness and that forthrightness in his storytelling, that's coming from the influence, I think, of, like I said, Cindy Crabb. 
and that kind of very straightforward storytelling. I don't know if Sandra Cisneros is a direct influence on him, but he reminds me also very much of Cisneros. For those of you that have read House on Mango Street, one of her famous, wonderful books, or if you've read some of her other essay collections or poetry collections, she also is very forthright, very autobiographical in talking about her work, as she was, if you remember, in the essay about her mom that I asked her to read for the midterm. So Porcelino is an interesting figure, just to kind of sum up some of these ideas. Born in Chicago, grew up in Hoffman Estates. He lives in Beloit, Wisconsin now uh, with his wife. Uh, and he's been there for the last decade or so. Uh, he, he teaches uh, some guest classes or it does some lecturing up at University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, which is uh, where they have some comic art programs. So he's, he's been doing more of that teaching lately. Uh, as he's gotten older, and uh, he publishes a lot. You know, he he's he does a book every couple of years, mostly with these autobiographical stories. He did a book on Henry David Thoreau, the famous American uh, author for um, uh, Hyperion Books, which is an imprint of the Disney Company. So he's he's a professional artist. You know, he's a professional writer, professional artist, which was his dream as a kid. You're going to notice that in the autobiography here, uh, and he's sort of living that that dream of being a writer and an artist. But he, but his writing and his art, as I said, has a very social uh, community focus, you know, again, where he wants to really shine a light on these challenges and these issues, try to tell good stories, but also kind of reach out a hand, uh, a helping hand, I think, to his readers to say, you know what, you're not the only person going through some of these these challenges, so you're, you're going to make it and you're going to get through. And I think that's the message of this book, which is why I've always liked teaching it. I feel like it resonates, I think, even more now, uh, you know, in, in the times that we're living through. And so I hope you enjoy it and I hope you um, take some comfort and some joy from it. He's a, he's a really funny writer too. There's a lot of really funny scenes, but they're subtle. He's got that very Midwestern dry sort of humor, uh, which I think you're going to pick up on. So again, he's born in Chicago, grew up in Hoffman Estates, uh, went to NIU, graduated in, I believe, 1990 with a degree in studio art and painting. And then has spent most of the last uh, 30 years since graduating. Oh, there's an awesome bulldog crossing the street here. I wish I should... It's too hard to turn my computer around, but I, he's, he's just awesome. He's just walking along. He's very purposeful, this, this bulldog. Um, they're such great dogs. Um, okay, anyway, what was I saying? He's, uh, uh, he's been a professional artist uh, since his 20s, and he's been doing books like this since the late 90s. I think this first edition of this one came out in 2000, which was his very first book. So when you read it, again, think about what you'd want to write about. What would you want to research? Go through the, uh, the uh, interviews when you have a chance. See what he talks about. Um, see what questions you have. If you have any questions on the book, please let me know and I'd be happy to answer them. And as I said, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy his writing style, his drawing style. Uh, the, you know, I'm confident given all the other great work you've done this semester, the paper four is going to be a really strong essay and it's going to build up to paper five. And so we're going to use porcelain all the way through April until the end of the semester, along with Solonin, that other book I mentioned, which we'll get into in the middle of April. So like I said, please make sure you get those over the break and, um, and, and find copies of them. One last thing I'm going to mention before I sign off and post this video, um, now that the weather's getting nice and because this is set locally, I'm looking forward to being able to take a couple of videos as I did for the Dybeck story in, in the city because there's a couple of scenes that take place here in Chicago uh, on, on the lake. So uh, maybe uh, I think this weekend's going to be nice. I want to get another couple of videos done outside. But in the meantime, as I said, the main thing right now, aside from making sure you have your copy of Perfect Example and starting reading it when you can, have a great break. Take care of yourselves. Stay, stay, stay safe. Uh, try to get outside with your mask on when you can. And uh, I will see you again. Probably post another video over the break because I'm excited to get outside and, and, and do some more filming. Um, and I will be available for emails. Um, I won't be as quick. I, I'll probably check my email once a day over the break. Um, so if you have any questions, you can email me. I may not be as quick as I am when we're in regular classes, but I will check my email. I will get back to you. And uh, I will see you again in about a week. So have a great break and I will talk to you later. Bye.